All right, so today, um, so please continue the great discussion in the chat uh, and thank you. Um, I forget your name, but it, someone created um, a group on in Zotero, so you can add the, the citations and, and there were lots of discussions with citations. Uh, Hendrik, yes. Uh, so thank you, Hendrik. Um, okay, so we'll have, uh, I'll have like a short introduction to, to neural networks, um, hopefully motivate uh, why they work so well, what's going on, like why didn't we have this before? Um, hopefully that will connect to what we discussed on Tuesday related to, you know, bias variance and the size of the data uh, that we have. And then we'll have a presentation by Han on uh, convolutional neural networks and Lijian on bias in AI. So something that we haven't discussed here is that many of these models are so complicated that they're really hard to understand for humans. So they might carry some biases. Now, today we will have, we have the deadline for the projects. I wanted to say a couple of things. So first, if you don't have a group or you want to change, that's fine. That is just basically, we're just trying to give you as much freedom as, as you want to submit a project that you find interesting. We don't want you to be, uh, to feel trap in an idea or something. So just feel free to, to switch and, and discuss or send us a message, that's fine. And if, if tomorrow uh, you don't want to present, um, that's fine too, it's optional. But I think it would be good to, to, to just see, um, to just see what, um, what you're doing, maybe get feedback from us or from the rest. Some questions might be uh, useful for you. So it's all, it's all meant to, to to enhance your, your project. Um, and so, so Daniel, just real quick, uh -huh. um, talking about the tomorrow. It, it, so I just want to make sure everyone in the class knew that there'd been a little bit of a change in uh, plans or if that, because uh, I, I just, because some students were a little bit confused about when they were presenting their oh, yes, yes, final sorry. project versus their proposal. Yeah, so today at midnight, we're in our time. So in like uh, 14 hours, uh, you have to submit uh, to me and, and to Stephen through email, your one pager. And then tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, we'll have a block where you will present uh, four to five minutes your project. Is that what you mean, uh, Stephen? Right, right. So this is a new, uh, a new yeah, this sort is of a, a, an idea we had. And again, this is this is the optional thing where basically yeah. it's an opportunity for you to, to just throw out your ideas and, and see if... Um, anyone else in the group has comments or questions that might be helpful exactly so um and, and i will i will pick the pdf that you send me or the document or the email you send me your proposal in and i will just project it on the screen so you just need to just uh, talk and present uh, that uh, so just just as simple as possible um all right so i will continue with or try to introduce some of the concepts that are uh, important in, in uh, deep learning. Uh, first, I'll start with just neural networks uh, because new, deep learning is it's neural networks. But I think that there are a lot of, there are a lot of little things that were added that make neural networks that are deep work well. So now to um, I cannot possibly cover this in you know in two hours or three hours. Uh, so I'm gonna just refer to this couple of books. Um, the first book was published a couple of years ago. It's free to access. You can, you can look at it. It's fairly technical. Then the second book, it's, uh, I would say a little bit more like programming oriented. So it's based on a particular package that the author created for running uh, deep neural networks. So it makes it easier for, for you to try things. All right. So So let's see. So I think I have to stop at 11 something. Okay, so um, now let me, let me motivate by saying that if we were to run something like object recognition with a traditional 
regression, for example, let's assume, let's say that we have two classes, okay? So we have like, is there a dog or not in this image? Okay, so that's the, that's the task and we show, okay, is there a camera that maybe that's, that's more related to, to what I'm showing here on the screen. Then you, what you will need to do, you will need to, if it, if it was a, a logistic regression, so basically it's a linear uh, mapping from the features into the outcome, um, it will just take all the pixels for, from the image and it will just flat them out into a long vector of pixels and it will weight each of the pixels saying, yeah, I think this color contributes to this being a dog. I think this color doesn't contribute to this being a dog. So they will fight independently to say whether something is a dog or, or not, or that it, whether it, pass, it passes a threshold to decide that. So, um, so in that sense, models that are simple, and by simple, I mean linear, have a hard time capturing things that we as humans see in images. Okay, so when we see an image, we see a lot of structure in it. We don't just see individual pixels being independent of each other. We see objects, we see shapes, colors, patterns, um, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the other name? Um, yeah, patterns of, um, uh, and, 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 and they, have, they have names, right? So a face, we are detecting a dog, we, we expect the head of the dog to be in a certain part of the body, uh, being, be having a certain proportion in the, in the body. So it's really hard to, or impossible really to capture those things. So one of the interesting um, points that Lucy was uh, in her talk was talking about, and, and, and one of the realizations with deep neural networks and neural networks in general is that in a sense, you can pass the raw pixels and by being so complex, they start capturing higher level uh, descriptions of the data. So they start creating basically this compound uh, neurons that capture shapes, capture local uh, features of the image. Uh, so in a sense, they compute higher level features and um, a lot of the applications, at least that I use in Science of Science, it's not, it's not me training something from scratch, defining a new architecture. It's many times just taking something that somebody else uh, um, pre-trained on a data set, like as she was talking about, uh, Cybert and, and Spectre, and train that and then take the latest, the latest layers from a new network. Um, and then that's what I use for my, my classification. All right, so what's a neural network? Well, or what's the, well, the neural network uh, is supposed to be taking a lot of um, inspiration from how the brain works. That was the uh, original idea when, even when AI started, uh, the, the uh, original meetings were all about thinking how to translate biological ideas or, or concepts into artificial systems. So. Uh, I think the, the easiest analogy uh, for, oh, sorry. The, the easiest analogy for neural networks is to think about the visual system in the brain. Um, so when you see something with your eyes that gets transmitted back, there is a, a big uh, chunk of connections that go back, goes back into the back of your brain and that gets received there from a group of neurons called V1. And they do some fairly simple, well, not simple, but they, they do some computation. And that computation is, is then translated to the next area of the, of the eye, of the visual system. Um, of course, I'm making many simplifications. I'm not a neuroscientist, even though I studied neuroscience for a couple of years. Um, and, and, and then those, the V2 computes, if you, you can think of it, other set of features that then get sent to the next layer of neurons. Now, what's interesting is that there has been studies uh, where they measure what's happening in these areas uh, of, the, of the brain, of the visual system. So they show, let's say they have an animal and they, they, they try to measure the activity of the neurons in these different layers. And they have found that uh, the initial, let's say V1, the initial layers detect some simple things like 
like certain, certain orientations of, of simple stimulus. Let's say we show a gradient like this with a certain 45 degree angle. And, and then you have neurons in this area that, that are active when a certain angle happens, for example. So that will be V1. But then when they measure V2, they will start uh, detecting other things. Like it's just not, not just a combination of, of angles, but maybe they will start detecting little corners of the image or little structures that are higher level that require combination of, of these lower level features. So neurons try, artificial neural networks uh, try to, to uh, reproduce that in, in, in the artificially. Um, and they do that by taking a couple of concepts from real neural networks. Okay, so the first, of course, is the neuron, where you have, um, it's basically a cell, specialized cells, uh, a cell of, of our body. We have a, a body, the body of the neuron, and then it has this structure called the axon that it, it connects to other neurons. Okay, so you have a neuron that receives information from other neurons through the synapses. Um, and then something happened here in the, in the body. We still don't know very well what happens here, but there are some chemical reactions that, based on the inputs from other neurons, trigger uh, um, a release of, of current that goes through the axon. Okay, so we say neural networks, you know, they are connected, that a neuron receives connection, and then those connections are added, or there is some relatively simple computation. And then once, once that passes a certain threshold, or um, or whether, uh, or once uh, you know the neurons are added together, they they increase the probability of something happening. Then we think of that probability as as whether there will be a, a trigger um, activity here in the axon. Uh, of course, this is this is very complicated. It's it's, it's a very complicated um, uh, chemical reaction. So. I'm not gonna get into that. In fact, I don't even understand it very well. <clears throat> but uh, you can think, I mean, and there are many, many, many simplifications that the connection from other, new, other neurons could be the summations as part of a sigmoid function. So basically it will be uh, a process in which you will be adding the inputs or subtracting depending on the weights of the other neurons. And once that passes a certain threshold, you will have the release of an action action potential, which is a connection. So you can think of the of the connections to your neurons as computing the probability of having a, um, a activity in that neuron, activation in that neuron. So let's so let's think about the simplest possible, just one neuron. Um, so. Uh, in, again, in one neuron, we simplify everything by saying we have some inputs. These inputs could be inputs from the data itself, like in the case of, of text analysis, this could be some embedding of the words or some embedding of the tokens or some encoding of, of the inputs from the text. In images, this will be pixel uh, intensities, so all these X values. Or this could also be uh, connections from other neurons. So. Uh, they will get uh, connected to the neuron, and then the neuron will have uh, basically uh, two things. One will be just the accumulation of the inputs uh, with some weighting. So you will have a, a linear combination, basically, of the, of the inputs to the neurons. And then you will have a simple nonlinearity after that. So you can have something like a sigmoid or a rectified linear unit there inside, and that will form the output of the neuron. Okay, so it's a very simple idea. You get inputs that are linearly combined, and then you, you apply a small nonlinearity, and that's the output. But the key is that, and the inspiration from the brain is that we have, um, we have these neurons uh, combined in, in, uh, in layers first, and then uh, you have those layers connected to each other uh, but not connections within uh, within la the, the layer. Okay, so for example, one of the things that we uh, use from the visual system is that we have an input. Let's say these are these are the eyes. This is the image that we're seeing with our eyes. This will be V1. So we receive the connections to the V1 area of our brain. There is some computation here that happens, and then those those neurons are connected to the next area of the brain, V2. 
And the idea is that there are not connect there are no connections within the same area. So V1 wouldn't have connections to other V1 neurons. This is not entirely true in real neural networks, but that's that's the basic idea. So you have this layer-wise structure, and then simple computational uh, computations happen happening inside. Now, the power of neural networks comes from the, rep the representability that they have. Because first, the neurons have non-linearities inside, and also you have layers. So you have this, uh, you can think of the output as this recursive application of non-linear functions. And that can create really complicated uh, output uh, functions. So I had uh, a small demo here. I don't know if it's going to work. What it kind of had like two neurons, and I mean, like this is this is a this is a sigmoid connected to another sigmoid, so it might be a little confusing. But if I zoom in here, uh, there is a sigmoid inside here, and that's connected to a secondary sigmoid. So I have two sigmoids, okay, and then I just have one input, okay. So the x-axis here is one input. So if I modify these parameters, it creates some really uh, complicated shapes. Uh, so it moves it around uh, and it's, 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 it can be uh, very complicated uh, in, in what it predicts. So uh, if, if you remember uh, lines, well, lines are very simple, They're just lines. So if you have a regression, then it cannot uh, reproduce uh, something like that. So you will just have a line and you will just move around with the line, perhaps with a little with a, with a little intercept. That didn't work, but, but basically you, you have a very simple a relationship between the input and the output. When you, when you have nonlinearities and they're nested, the relationship can be much more complicated. Um, Okay, but neural networks are not always the right answer, especially deep neural networks. Um, so you have to kind of know when to apply them. And this is connected to the first, uh, well, the, the lecture on Tuesday where I show this idea of, of bias variance, underfitting and overfitting. So neural networks have, have so much power that they're really easy to overfit. So you have to be careful and see when you, when you use them. Also, they need a lot of data and they need a lot of computational power uh, in in uh, Lucy's presentation, I think I saw uh, 1,800 GPU hours of computation. If you're using cloud computing, that's a lot of money to train a language model. So you have to be careful there. And sometimes the gain in performance are not might not be worth it. And you saw, well, usually when you read an NLP paper, they have sometimes like one two percent increase, uh, and that cannot maybe doesn't translate into uh, amazing real gains. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about how to train neural networks, uh, but I won't go into the details because this requires a little bit of, of calculus. And but, but the basic idea is that, well, you have all these connections among the neurons, and you have to find the right connection so that the neuron learns what you're trying to do. So uh, and in a supervised setting, that means that you will have inputs and you will have outputs and you're trying to find a function that, that makes a connection. And that function is just a neural network. So you can think that that function is simply a function that has some parameters and I call them here theta. It's, it's a huge set of, of, of weights of my network. When we talk about modern models like BERT for NLP or uh, Hanwell show us how to use, uh, I believe, ResNet, and Lijian will show us how to use other nets. We're talking about millions of parameters, okay? So it's, it's, it's a lot of, they're very, very heavy models. So, so how do we find those parameters? How do we, how do we, do we change them so that we try to predict the, the output uh, as close as possible? So, well, we can do it in a very, in a very straightforward way, although it's not completely straightforward because you have to create a sensible loss function. But basically you have to say, I'm gonna penalize if I make a mistake, I'm gonna penalize those mistakes. So if this loss function is it's differentiable, then we can do something called gradient descent. Um, 
there are many in modern deep learning, we do many modifications of those algorithms. But the basic idea is that we try to change the parameters little by little so that we every step we uh, try to minimize the loss function and we approach some sort of local solution. So uh, gradient descent is a very simple idea. So we do, we, we do many iterations of the following process. We take, we start the network at random. So we initialize the connections randomly and we will predict, predict just random stuff. So the input will have no connection with the output. So we'll commit lots of errors. But what we will do next is we'll, we'll start modifying uh, those weights little by little by using the gradient. So basically this is a generalization of the derivative. And, and basically what we will do, uh, and this is a toy example, uh, let's imagine this is the gradient. What we will do, we will look at the, at the um, change that is happening in your current solution. Okay, so this theta t, t means the iteration of the, of the uh, gradient descent. We'll compute the gradient at that point and we'll see where the gradient is pointing to. And because the gradient is pointing to, is pointing down, that means that we have a negative gradient, okay? A negative uh, line is going down. So that means, and intuitively perhaps, that we have to move our current solution to the opposite side of the gradient, okay? So because if the gradient is negative, it means that the loss function will go down if I move to the right. Okay, so we so this is expressed in the gradient descent algorithm. We compute um, the following, we do the following operation. We take the current solution, we subtract the gradient, but we multiply that by some constant and we call this const, constant the learning rate. So we modify that and, and then modifying that, we jump to the next solution and then we iterate this process again. Now, because neural networks are very complex, you have very, uh, again, connections that are non-linear, nested, the loss function will be, can be, and is usually very, very complex, okay? So it won't look like, like we just one solution, but it will be perhaps many solutions. So here I'm showing a toy, toy example of this. So in this loss function, we have two solutions. This is a local, Minima, so local minimum. So it's a, it's not the best solution. The best solution is here. So it has lower uh, loss. So, but if we do, if you apply gradient descent, and if we start, let's say here, we will go greedily to the right because gradient descent is greedy. It will just go to the place where the gradient goes um, goes down, basically. So you won't pay a price of increasing the gradient first and then decreasing it more. Now there are uh, some solutions to this and I'll quickly go over the basic idea, but instead of computing the gradient on all the data, so I'm having a perfect representation of the, of the loss function, we can do samples of the data. And this is what happens with neural networks. We go through batches of data and we get therefore observations. You can think of them as stochastic observations of the loss function. So when we optimize just by chance, someone sometimes we might jump over uh, some, some higher loss areas. So, and that's fine because uh, with this stochasticity, we might escape this local minimum. Okay, so, <clears throat> so how, do we, how do we compute these gradients? Well, because the neurons, the architectures are, I'm gonna skip, some of these, and by some I mean a lot. Um, when you have, uh, when you think of the neural network, you have these layers, okay? So you have inputs that go through all these, these uh, functions, basically. So when you are computing the gradient of the loss function with respect to some weight of the neural network, uh, it's gonna be the derivative, basically, of a very deeply nested uh, neural network. So sometimes that derivative can be very deep, so how do we compute that? Well, we can take advantage of the uh, chain rule in, in, uh, in uh, calculus. And that means that to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to a weight, we just compute the gradient with respect to the loss uh, to, with respect to the weights of the first layer. And then we do the derivative of those, the, the weights of that layer 
with the weights of the previous layers and so on and so forth. So we go, we can go backwards in a sense in the in the computation of the gradient. So, uh, and that's where one of the um, algorithms uh, comes in. So uh, there was a, a paper, I guess 40 years ago, almost, that proposed this idea of, of computing very efficiently the gradient of a loss function in a neural network by taking advantage of the architecture that it has. So because we have neurons in layers, uh, we can do this optimization where we know that we have to compute a chain of, of uh, derivatives. So we can say, well, derivatives that are in layer L2, because we will compute a, a chain, by definition, we'll use derivatives that we will compute for layer L1, okay? So layer L will use derivatives, layer L1 will use its derivative, and also the, the derivatives from layer L, L2 will do this, use derivatives from here, from here, and from here. So we can save computations from the forward layer when we do the computation of, of gradients. And that's the basic idea of, of back propagation. So if you want to compute the gradient, let's say of a particular uh, lay of a particular weight here, uh, you, you do the computation and what would happen is that, um, I'm gonna skip here. If you compare the computation in layer L2 with the computation in layer L1, L3, sorry, a layer before that, you will see that this, part of the computation will be shared. Okay, so you can say these little pieces and that's the basis of backpropagation. All right, let's see. Um, I guess I'll show you immediately. Oh no, let's see. Um, Yeah, okay, so we have a notebook here on uh, for uh, the first part. Um, here, so it's, and, and it just introduces one of the packages that we will be using. Uh, and that package is called uh, PyTorch. And let's see how much time I have. I guess I'll skip this part because I'll, I want to talk about it later. Yes. All right. So, um, now what I explained before apply to neural networks, you know, from the last 40 years, 50 years, in fact, it's like 60 years. That's when one of the first ideas from neural networks was presented. But what we, Today, we consider neural networks are really deep neural networks in the sense that we have, you know, not just four layers, but we have, in some cases, 50 or more layers. The problem is that when you have these layers, when you're trying to compute the gradient, when you have many, many layers, when you try to compute the gradient, because it's a multiplication of multiple numbers, uh, the gradient can get really, really small. Okay, so trying to adapt the weights of neurons that are very early on in the neural network, uh, it, it will be very, very slow because just the multiplication will make that the changes are so tiny that you, the gradient descent will never, com never converge. So, um, so deep learning is really a combination of things. It's, it's, it's not just that we have more layers, but we have better training techniques that realize, okay, we need to not just follow the gradient, but we need to maybe change the learning rate as we train so that maybe we, we need to make big changes to the network early on. And then later on, maybe we need to slow down that learning rate. Uh, we have more computational power. In fact, in our little uh, environment that we set up for the, for the course, for the summer school, we have GPUs. So, and because GPUs are so well adapted to compute uh, kernels, they are very good at computing uh, matrix operations and back propagation is basically matrix uh, multiplication. Uh, the same with other kinds of uh, networks like uh, convolutional neural networks. Well, to compute convolutions is very easy with GPUs. 
So you can get really, really big speed ups with GPUs uh, as compared to CPUs. Also, because neural networks are so big, they need a lot of data to achieve good performance. Okay, so it takes time to see the the um, the performance gains, the performance gains, especially if you are starting from scratch. And we have new types of neurons that were that have been proposed over the last uh, you know couple of years. So we have not just sigmoids, which are uh, not uh, they have some issues with when you are learning. They have proposed uh, rectified linear units. They have proposed dropout. Other kinds of, of neurons are, are techniques so that you speed up and you allow yourself to add layers. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, architectures that go beyond simple layer-wise stacks of, of multi of fully connected neurons. So this, this architecture that I'm showing here is called a multi-layer perceptron because uh, in the 60s, there was this architecture called Perceptron that was just one uh, layer. Uh, so if you add layers and uh, connections among them, that's a multi-layer Perceptron. But basically, it's just uh, a, st a stack of, of, uh, of ne and neurons that are fully connected uh, across uh, layers. Um, now, this uh, is not the greatest architecture for image analysis, and probably Han will discuss a little bit about that, but basically, for image analysis, you still have to flatten out the pixels. Let's say if you're analyzing an image, you still have to do that. But with images, you have more spatial structure. So there is this uh, type of neural network or layer really called convolutional neural network that tries to establish these local uh, constraints. So you say, OK, it doesn't matter where I see something on the, on the image. It doesn't matter that the chair is like on the lower bottom of the image or the top right of the image. Did I say lower bottom? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a location. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, you will just get the same kind of activations. Um, so one of the, I mean, the, one of the first applications uh, where it showed really good performance was on the MNIST data set. And we saw this on, on Tuesday where we use, I think, uh, gradient boosting or, or something like that. And it was decent performance, but CNN are really, the ones that have the highest performance on this task. Um, now, when we, when we have to deal with other kinds of structures, also it's better to use specialized um, architecture. So in her talk, Lucy was talking about uh, text analysis. And, and in text, um, a very intuitive way of thinking about text is that you produce the, the, the words when you are talking or when you are translating uh, based on what you have talked about before. Right? So, and, and also you can think of, let's say, uh, when, you're, when you look at the stock market or any, any kind of temporal data or driving a, a vehicle, you're looking at things that happened before to, to produce the, the, section, the, 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 uh, the predictions for the next step. And then you will use those predictions or, or what you will observe next to make the next prediction after that. So with temporal, data, with temporal data, you have this idea that you are carrying on some sort of state in your predictions. And, and there is a whole set of, of architectures related to that called recurrent neural networks that have state inside them that is keeping track of, well, we don't really know what they're keeping track of because they're really hard to understand, but they are keeping track of the state of what's happening. Maybe if you are doing text analysis, they're keeping track of maybe the context or, or the gender of the person you're talking about. So they're keeping that uh, track of that until let's say later on, they have to modify a pronoun based on the gender uh, of, the, of the sentence, for example. Um, now, recur basic and recurring neural networks uh, have had some, some issues uh, in the sense that first, um, because of the recurrence, the gradients tend to get either really, really big or really, really small because you're calling the same function again. So taking the gradient of this recursive call will make things explode or vanish. So there have been these other architectures proposed to solve some of those issues. Um, and you can, you can play with this. This is one of the great things about neural network is that you can have these little pieces, these cells and these layers that you can combine. Okay, so here, it's a combination of, of different recurrent neural networks where you can say, okay, I'll use this, let's say, to produce 
a review of a text. So I have an input, a set of words, and then I will just produce whatever stars I will have in my review. But you can also think of, of, of uh, architecture like this, where you have like a translation. Okay? You input something, let's say in English, and then the output is going to be in Spanish. So you have a sequence to sequence prediction. And you have now even more complex um, architectures where you are looking at, um, at agents uh, interacting in the environment. And if you've been keeping track of what's been happening with uh, DeepMind in, in London, they have really uh, pushed the boundaries of what's possible with reinforcement learning. I won't get into the details, but for a long time, reinforcement learning was really hard to scale. So they had all these really simple, simple task where you will have these agents uh, acting in mazes and trying to create plans to navigate these mazes, but you, they will only do it based on simple uh, feedback. Um, so they scaled that to unbelievable degrees where they now have a, a program that can play Go, which is a type of, of uh, it's, a, it's a much more complicated problem than chess and they were able to uh, beat the, the world uh, champion in Go. So, and, um, so there are a couple of demos in the slides. If you have time, we can go through them. They're pretty cool. And I think a couple of uh, OpenAI, which is a company or a foundation, I don't know what it is, here in the US, they uh, took the, some of these ideas of reinforcement learning into video games. So they produce a, a team. This is a game called um, Dota, they, they produce a team that beat uh, the top players in this, in this game. Uh, now, the cool thing about this is that they didn't provide any uh, kind of unfair advantage to the machines. The machine will just look at the screen, just like humans, and they will take uh, the points that they get, basically the number of kills or whether they will win the match, to learn whatever sequence they need to produce to win a match. So. It's, it's kind of, it's something called a semi-supervised problem where you don't provide the entire plan that they need to uh, apply, but they learn how to construct a sequence of, of, of actions to maximize the chances of winning a match. Um, there are many examples of, uh, this is also one of my favorite examples where they now take uh, text uh, and they produce audio based on that text. And these uh, kind of technologies have been uh, already made available in, in, um, in commercially. I mean, I, the other couple of months ago, I was using an API uh, from Amazon that will that allow me to take text and produce audio uh, of, of voices that sounded much more natural than what I would hear you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago. So uh, this, it's all deep learning. Uh, another application that is uh, very interesting, but also very scary in a sense, is this idea of having uh, neural networks that generate data. And if you're a Bayesian uh, like I was, or I am, uh, this sounds very, very appealing. You always want to learn the distribution of data. And these neural networks are basically dominated and, and show the amazing potential of neural networks. So basically you have two neural networks competing one to produce images that are realistic or basically pr produce data that is that is realistic and you have another neuron neural network that is trying to detect whether um whether uh, the the data that is produced is realistic or not so so but it doesn't know well you have to kind of train it very clearly it doesn't know sometimes if the data is coming from the person who is trying to create fake data or the data is really coming from the real world. So, uh, so you have these two competing uh, neural networks. Um, but the cool thing is that you can have uh, neural networks that given a just noise um, can generate anything. And the, the most uh, prominent applications of these are neural networks for generating faces. And probably you've seen this website, but it's a website that uh, that was trained, I think, on faces of, of celebrities or something like that, a very, very large data set. And uh, every time you visit the, this website, this person does not exist, it produces a person. So first it generates randomly noise, which is amazing already. 
And based on that, they have a huge neural network that generates an image starting and starting entirely based on that noise. So when you visit this website and you load it, uh, basically it runs an iteration of this neural network. And this uh, very high resolution uh, images are generated by, by a neural network. And these people basically do not, do not exist. And that's the, the, the name of the website. Now it's, it's not entirely perfect. I mean, you can see some artifacts. So, but I think there's, there have been some cases of, of fake news and, and fake accounts on Twitter trying to use these images. In fact, I think there was a famous uh, machine learning researcher who was creating fake accounts to defend himself on Twitter. That was pretty funny. Okay, so um, I'll show you an example of, of how to run a neural network. Um, and uh, we'll show you, I'll show you with this, with this web demo, okay? So, um, and I wanted to show you two things. So, well, I'll show you, so this demo, uh, you, you can run a neural network online. So it runs on JavaScript and you can choose different types of, of data sets, but I will pick this data set here, the, the lower bottom one. Okay, so it's a very simple data set. It's a classification data set where you have two classes and I'm going to reduce all of this, okay? So I can define the hidden neurons, the hidden layer, sorry. And I can define how many neurons I have per layer, okay? So this is just a multi-layer perceptron. And I reduce this to the maximum possible extent. So this is a, this is a one neuron, one layer neural network, okay? And I have the input, so just have the natural inputs, the X1 and the X2. And with one neuron, what this produces is simply, I'm not going to choose as activation key the sigmoid. What this chooses is just simply to, because it's just one neuron, there is no nonlinearity. I mean, there's still nonlinearity inside, but it's because it's just one neuron, uh, there is no recursive application of this. So the surface that you will see uh, out uh, in the out um, in the last neuron is going to be just yes, aligned. So if I run this, it will run iterations of gradient descent. Okay, so to repeat, I, I selected the data, I selected the features, I will for now just select these two features and I change here the configuration of the neural network. And now I can click play and it will run gradient descent. And as you can see, it's running, it converged really, really fast. Here's showing the loss function that it started high and then it went down really quickly. And it's, show, it's, it's showing how it learned to classify, uh, classify the, the data set. Okay, so this is a really, really cool way of looking at how uh, the parameters of learning help. Okay, so if I, for example, one of the things that when you're learning to train neural networks, one of the things that is puzzling is, uh, not puzzling, but one of the things that you have to decide is the learning rate. So if the learning rate is really small, it's going to take a long time for a neural network to converge. Okay, so I, I chose a really tiny learning rate. As you can see, it's taking a long time to converge. On the contrary, if I choose a learning rate that is too big, it's going to diverge because, uh, well, when you follow the gradient, sometimes you can follow it too strongly. And then instead of going lower in the next iteration, you go, you, you appear in an area of the loss function that it has worse uh, results. So if I do a learning rate of three, uh, well, in this case, it worked because I think uh, this example. It's just too simple, but when you have a neural network that is more complicated, uh, you can have, you know, it doesn't converge at all. Okay, so we'll have an activity and the activity is really, really simple. And I hope I can share, uh, let's do this. I shared the entire screen. Is that sharing the science screen? No. Do you guys see the screen? Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to show you. Um, I want I want you to try this this thing where 
So you will go here, but then you, I want you to try this data set, this data set. And what's interesting about this data set, I will show you the first, the first task that I'm asking you to do. Okay. So I'm asking you on the first task to choose this data set, to choose one neuron and one hidden layer and run gradient descent and the learning rate, I'm gonna set it up to 2.3, let's say. Um, and if I run this, something will happen. And what will happen is that it won't converge. It won't be able to classify this piece of the data correctly. I hope that you can see that. Okay, and the reason is that when you have one neuron, it's basically logistic regression. It's basically a very simple linear model. So it doesn't have the ability to detect these more complicated structures. So I want you to do the follow the next step and, and do something called feature engineering. Okay, and then after you do the next step, I want you to do to add neurons and layers to the neural network so that you can see that something amazing happens inside a neural network. So why don't we take like maybe 10 minutes to do this. And then uh, we come back to the main room, okay? Any questions? Okay, so, so how are we measuring does not converge? Well, here, I, I mean, if you look at the, at the solution, it is not detecting, it's not putting a blue background on this area of the image. Okay, so that's what I mean. The performance is not that great. So a great performance will be, I'll show you here. So in this data set, if I run it, you can see that it perfectly classifies almost everything. And the loss function is really, really tiny, 0 0.001. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, it is. It's. Uh, I guess it's. It's not easy to know. I mean, you can uh, compute um, the loss function, but you never really know what's the lowest possible loss function. So, I guess one of the ways of, of doing it is just try it and see what the predictions look like. And if they don't look good, then it's not. It didn't do a good job. But that's a good point. Any other question? Okay, so try this. Let's try the second and the third activity and discuss. All right, so everybody's here. So let's see, what was the effect of this, of the first, the second point? Um, it converged much, much faster. Right. Well, in, in the first point, it didn't, it didn't converge at all, right? So here it doesn't really classify this at all, this area of the, of the, um, of the data. So when we add this, when we add this, it feels like cheating. Yeah. When, when you add this, um, it, it's, we are like basically saying, you know, consider the multiplication. That's a very important feature. Now, something important here to understand is that you could, in principle, learn very complicated functions if you, if you do very clever feature engineering, okay? So this is the cheating that Stephen is saying. Like, if you know what kind of problem you're dealing with, if you know that you can have things like the sore problem, you just add this feature. So this is very important to realize. This, neur this neuron, I mean, this neural network is a, is a linear neural network. So basically it's just a regression, 
Okay, so in principle, we could uh, we could uh, analyze nonlinear functions with a linear system only when we do very clever feature engineering. Okay, so if I run this, it will like converge. It will just find the solution immediately because this feature is just so good for this particular problem. And this is how people used to solve problems such as the one that Lucy was talking about, neural networks, sorry, natural language processing. People will use very, very complicated, uh, very hand created features for natural language processing. They will just have these very, very deep features that they will build. And then those features were passed into very simple classifiers. So what happens with the third, third uh, part of the of this activity. So if I if I remove these, and if I add neurons and layers, what happens? What happened here? It also converges, but takes a little bit longer time. Yes. Now, what's cool about the this? is that we didn't do any feature engineering, right? We just passed the raw features, right? But because we added neurons, I mean, uh, layers and, and neurons, I guess you can do that. Um, it's doing the feature engineering for us. And that's the cool thing about deep neural networks is that the neuron itself, because we have so much data, and in this case, we have infinite amount of data, we're just feeding, feeding data it will do the feature engineering for us. So we don't need to be clever, basically, in the input space. We can just pass the raw features and it will do the learning for us. Um, now, one thing that you will see with the demo from Han and Li Zhen and the things that Lucy was saying is that, yeah, this takes a long time for learning the features and it's still learning and but the, the cool thing is that you can then take a piece of the neural network, like say these layers, and I guess I can add neurons. So that, <laughs> let's see, maybe that's gonna be faster. Maybe let me increase the learning rate. I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. So it's prove my point. For this, for this problem, okay. you need at least four output neurons because you have four classes basically. So now it's just trying to uh, fit three classes, although there are four. No, you don't need, you don't need uh, four neurons. Really? Yeah. You can do it. Six, six, four. Okay. Oh, sorry. Six. Oh, so you added a lot of complexity. You, you can you can do it with three, three. Okay, three. that <laughs> that worked. Okay, so. And so here's the cool, the, the cool thing that we can do with neural networks these days. We can let other uh, rich companies like, uh, like uh, you know, Google train networks for us, like BERT. And then we can, track this, we can take this piece of the network and the, that piece of the network will produce these very rich features. Okay, so basically, look, these ne neurons learn this feature here, just using the data. Right, so which is amazing. So that's the idea of, of transfer learning. You, you don't need to learn the entire network yourself. You can grab these pre-built neural networks and you can, be, you can remove parts of the neural network to, to, do the, um, to do your task. So you can in principle use these as features in a linear layer, right? So here you can just add, add a linear layer. The only thing that you need is these very rich features. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of running a little bit out of time here, but uh, there are two uh, notebooks here that uh, go through uh, some of the stuff on, oh wait, this is not mine, sorry. I'm spoiling the, comes next. Uh, that go through some of the examples with recurring neural networks and with uh, PyTorch. So with PyTorch, you don't need to worry about any of the any of the things that I'm that I'm uh, 
any of the things that um, that I talked about before, like computing the gradient, knowing how to compute the um, knowing how to compute the, the the you know the derivative and all that stuff. It does everything for us. Okay, so um, and this this uh, presentation go goes through some of those examples and and. And the code. So let me show you the code. Um, so uh, there are two major libraries for deep neural networks. One is PyTorch or Torch, uh, and the other one is TensorFlow. Now, for research, I personally like Torch because it allows you to see what's happening inside. It's much more. I think mo most of the things are implemented in Python, so it's it's easy to debug and see what's going on, how it's doing the computation, the derivatives, and things like that. TensorFlow is like more production ready, I would say. Uh, so it's much more optimized for some tasks. So, and therefore it's a little harder to uh, debug, um, but both are fine. So now with Torch, you can just find, uh, you know, things similar to how you would do it with NumPy. And so here I'm just defining a random matrix, but the I mean, the cool thing is that this, this, this tensor which is just a matrix in this case, just two dimensional tensor, uh, has a much has much more functionality because it understands that sometimes you are inputting uh, a variable and it can compute gradients. So let's let me show you this, and with this I'll I'll uh, I'll let's take a break and then we have uh, Hans uh, presentation. So uh, here I'm trying to let's say I have this sequence of let's imagine this is just a, a neural network where we have this, this sequence of connections, I have, you know, uh, four weights and I have uh, kind of a, uh, it's like a neural network like this one. Okay, this is a, it's a silly neural network where you have these weights and then you have this, these neurons connected to the output here, uh, which is the D, but then you have a loss function here. Okay, here, and you have a loss function. So imagine that I want to compute the loss function with respect to some of the connections. Okay, so you can do that very easily. Uh, you define here. I'm defining a to be a variable. So let's imagine a is um, well. We I have the weights, so the weights are variables. So once I do that, uh, tensor uh, PyTorch, sorry, will keep track of the of of that of those variables as if they were symbolic representations. So it would allow me to compute the gradients automatically. Okay. So and the way to do it is to take, let's say, if I want to put the gradient of D with respect to W four. I just say to the variable D, compute all the gradients backwards through the network. And then I will ask to D4, what, to W4, sorry, what's the gradient there? So, uh, and it will, it will do it because it, 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 it will propagate it, the gradient automatically. Um, so here is, a, is an example of how to run gradient descent in a simple regression. Uh, and you can see that you can apply the, the same code that we were looking at. You have the learning rate and the gradient. It's very intuitive to run it. And um, and but we have Torch has more high level um, ways of creating neural networks. So instead of just defining everything in detail, you can go through uh, defining uh, multi layer perceptrons with a with this construction where you have. Um, the linear layers, rectified linear units, but this could be sigmoids, um, sigmoid, for example. Um, and then you, you just uh, run it through the gradient descent more easily. And you have yet more sophisticated way of doing it by using other kinds of optimizing, not just gradient descent. Gradient descent turns out has some, uh, this, it's slow because it always it's always applying the same learning rate, and if you you try in your in your uh, tests to use different learning rates, you saw that maybe at the beginning it's good to have big learning rate, but later on maybe it's small. It's better to have smaller learning rate later rates. All right. So, are there any questions? So I think I'll leave these two notebooks. So just to let you know, there are two notebooks. This RNN and the notebook for neural networks. Uh, please try them. They have, uh, this one has on RNN, it has um, an activity at the end. So if you want to work on that, 
after the break. It's a very relatively simple activity. You can you can try it. Um, are there any questions? Uh, with regard to NLP, this book by Einstein, it's great with this. No, I didn't know that. Now for NLP, Allen NLP has a Allen, Allen, Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence has a package called Allen, Allen NLP. And they do many of these tasks uh, relatively pain, painlessly. But there is yet, I think, another package that is even better than this one. That's the one that Lijian will talk on. It's called uh, Hugging Face. Um, okay, so let's take a uh, like 30 minute break. Let's come back here at, uh, at 11.30 to start uh, the talk by uh, Han. <laughs> 